hello. You're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is, real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with, too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Excellent. Hello, hello, hello. Um, my name is Chris Holscher. Welcome, everybody, to the, not a webinar, actually, but a panel discussion for the first time um, with uh, Robin Schaffer, my dear colleague from uh, the US, um, and two very special guests today. Um, Adam Coughlin, founder and CMO of uh, York IE, um, a VC house that you'll soon hear more about. And then Richard Stearman, um, uh, one of the, you know, I'm sorry, dinosaurs? No, but one of the big names in industry analyst relations um, and a former Gardner analyst and now doing his own thing. Um, and I'd like you both to introduce yourself for a moment. Um, Richard, why don't you go first? Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. This is an interesting topic for sure. So I'm a uh, industry analyst. Um, got started doing that in 2000, so 24 years ago at Gartner. Um, and after I left Gartner, I uh, realized that the only thing I'm cut out for is being an industry analyst. So I started my own firm so I could do what I like to do, which is, you know, talk to startups and the investor community and just be part of the ecosystem, helping move it along. Great. And, and do we want um, Richard to share a little non-business about himself, Chris? I've got a question. I, I have a question because like a hundred years ago or so, I um, listened to a podcast where uh, Richard was interviewed. And I don't exactly remember the topic. It must have had something to do with um, security and, and, and things. And um, a book was mentioned. And I wonder, um, Richard, if you want to say anything about this book title, is that something that you can tell us something about? I certainly can, and I know wh why it must have come up. There's my own copy um, of, of Walden by Thoreau. And, you know, it, it's the kind of book that takes a long time to read. But as I was reading it, I, of course, was enthralled with his space, right? He's writing a book. Um, he's got a little desk in a little cabin that he uh, kind of outfitted himself. And... I was inspired to have my own space. So I designed a writing cabin with the same dimensions as Thoreau's cabin on Walden. Um, also bears uh, a lot of resemblance to Dylan Thomas's writing cabin in Wales. Um, and that's what you see me in now. I've written uh, nine books since 2017, right from this little cabin. I need a cabin. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody needs a cabin. I'm going to put a cabin in my office. Exactly. That, to be honest, this, this cabin is located in my garage, so it's not very romantic, but it works. <laughs> That's great. Well, garage, forests, I mean, you know, where's the difference? It's a cabin. Yep. I, I can imagine it here. Do you keep your car in the forest? <laughs> no. <laughs> on the street. Uh, thank you. Um, that, was, that was amazing. Adam, glad to have you with us today. Tell us a bit about you. Yeah, great to be here. So uh, my name is Adam Coughlin. Uh, I actually started my career uh, as a journalist. Uh, I worked here in the United States. I worked in uh, China. I worked in Europe for a period of time. I uh, eventually made the transition into tech. Uh, I worked at a company called Dyn, uh, which was a DNS uh, company. Uh, I ran marketing communications, uh, so had a lot of experience kind of building out the analyst relations program of our company. Uh, we grew that company to about 100 million annual recurring revenue, got acquired by Oracle in 2016. Uh, two of my colleagues, three of my colleagues from uh, that uh, company, we kind of looked at our growth journey uh, as uh, Dyn and realized that a lot of sort of the legacy institutions that we turned to for help, um, you know, we're kind of operating out of antiquated models. 
Uh, so that was the genesis for us launching York IE in 2019. So we try to help technology companies grow. We do that, as Chris mentioned, through the investment side of our business, uh, where we're an early stage uh, B2B software kind of seed investor. Uh, and then we also have an advisory services side where we actually help uh, technology companies with uh, strategy and execution and product go to market and uh, finance. Um, so uh, love this topic and, and super excited and have known both Chris and Robin now uh, for years, which has uh, been fantastic. So, so what can we learn about you, um, Adam, that we don't know? Yeah, okay. So like uh, uh, la just last week, uh, I loaded up my minivan with my wife, my father-in-law, and my three children. Uh, and we drove from New Hampshire and did a history tour. Uh, we went to Washington's Crossing, uh, Philadelphia, Valley Forge, and Gettysburg. How uh, nice. It was a fantastic time, minus my daughter, uh, who's eight, uh, vomiting from New Hampshire to New Jersey, uh, which uh, <laughs> kind of put a little kink in the travel. But otherwise, she rebounded well, and we had a great time. She rebounded well. That's so driving. <laughs> So, um, Chris, I think we should introduce each other. Oh, wow. Okay. We, we know it, we work together a lot. We're, you know, we're not uh, partners, we're colleagues, um, but we share a lot of the same things. So Chris runs Holscher One, which is an analyst relations firm out of Europe, out of his home in Germany, and focuses on startups, entirely on startups because in his um, history doing many many things at BT over the years he recognized that startups have a huge opportunity with um, industry analysts and startups needed help with that and he saw the opportunity to help and I would say the fun fact about Chris is he loves Norway he has spent years of vacation time in Norway and that's all he goes to and he loves it that is true and i can actually tell a, a a short story just last week i was in in london um at a at an idc event and at the keynote presentation um the first the, you know one of the first uh, icebreaker questions that the presenter asked the audience was where in the world do you think the most pizza is consumed and of course people went well italy or united states or you know then they went a little bit more Daring, and I just knew it's Norway per capita. Pizza per capita, it's Norway. And he was oh, wow. the only way that I knew that. <laughs> that kind of speaks to my uh, close. Uh, How into Norway he is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, do a quick intro to me because I want to get going on this conversation. Well, Robin's great. Let's go. No. Okay. <laughs> you got it. I met, I met Robin um, uh, through her book, Analysts on Analyst Relations, um, a while ago. So Robin's uh, been doing analyst relations for um, many, many, many years. And at some point, she decided to um, add a really interesting angle uh, to the knowledge world of analyst relations. And that was to interview a whole bunch of industry analysts for their inside perspective on the matter. So kind of a behind the scenes um view and out came a phenomenal book um that's become kind of a you know a industry staple uh for for analyst relations i read it and i thanked her um uh, for for writing it and uh within a minute or so she responded saying well glad you you like it let's jump on a call i've been reading your posts and since then we've we've kind of spent like almost every day speaking uh, to each other, setting up the state of startups with industry analyst research program with the University of Edinburgh. My wife is complaining that I'm spending more time online with, <laughs> with Robin Schaefer. My um, husband. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that is is Robin. She has a phenomenal mind on, on analyst relations. Um, and very often she comes from the from the one end of thinking, I come from the other, and then we meet somewhere in the middle, and it's always so productive. So I, I just I love love this relationship. So that's Robin. Okay, so um, fun fact about Robin. Oh, 
she's a singer. She's a wonderful um, folk music um, composer and singer. And if you get a chance, absolutely check out one of her videos. Um, it's lovely texts, beautiful singing. So um, give it a try. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for that plug. Okay, let's jump into it. Um, it's a long introduction, but we're such fascinating people. But I want to start with just asking Adam, who's an investor, um, uh, part of investment uh, as part of what he does, is why do investors work with analysts? Yeah, so, you know, you would think that uh, giving away money was easy, uh, but turns out being an investor, it's very competitive, right? And there's constantly uh, things changing both in the market and the competitive landscape, and it's very difficult uh, to keep your finger on that pulse, right? And as an investor, you really have to view company and company building from a market in perspective, right? Like a lot of founders, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs think of things as product out. I had this problem, I solved it, now everybody is going to want to buy it, right? But as an investor, when you're investing in a company, uh, what you need to have happen is that you need to have that company ascending uh, at the same time that the market that they are in is ascending as well too, right? The last thing you want is a company that's doing great as the market itself is declining. Uh, and so you have to have that understanding. And the ways that you do that is through all sorts of different um, information. And one of the best sources of information, which we'll talk about a lot during this call, is analysts. That's great. Right. And um, let me take that forward then to, to Richard directly. So how, how from your perspective, how, how does the analyst side um, work with investors? What's, you know, what's in for you? Um, and also, um, how, how do you feel you can support this uh, challenge that Alan is going to in big picture? Yeah. So um, investors, of course, are interested in particular spaces, right? They develop a thesis, um, they read in the newspapers that cybersecurity is underserved and CISA is saying everybody should do X. Um, and if they're coming from it, you know, without any expertise, they have to get up speed quickly. Um, and I know from personal experience, it takes me, you know, when I switch jobs or something and get into a new area, it takes me six months to a year to understand the business, let alone the ecosystem it evolves in. <clears throat> Investors don't have that much time. So a partner investor might come to them and say, hey, there's a startup called Wiz. Uh, we want to know if you want to be part of this you know, investment round. And they wouldn't know where to start you know, or even how to look at the background of the founder. So they turn to industry analysts who spend all day, every day, talking to everybody in the industry and have this wealth of uh, experience and understanding of the industry that comes from years and years of working in it. And I first started working with investors at Gartner when Gartner was just back in 2000, Gartner was just um, going down the path of taking, you know, a limited number of analysts in a very limited amount of published research and breaking it up into different kinds of seats that they could sell to different kinds of consumers. So, so you had the same investment in analysts and the time they've got involved in research, um, but you just keep reinvesting in sales teams so they can sell to CMOs, they can sell to CEOs, they can sell to startup CEOs. And one of the very first breakouts that they created was called Gartner Invest, which was a Gartner seat for investors. And they targeted mostly Wall Street, you know, so buy side and sell side on Wall Street, um, their analysts, et cetera. And eventually that became a big thing post Enron, where the, the big firms no longer had their own analysts to work with. Um, and then in my own, you know, practice, uh, I work with a lot of startups and I have a product right now which is a database to get people up to speed quickly on the industry it's got a cybersecurity industry they've got 3,800 vendors that i track and 10,500 products and we have subscribers who are investors so it's my answer to gartner invest um, and private equity and vcs use it to test out their theses research and do due diligence on the vendors and competitors of the people that they're investing in. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a great relationship. It really helps 
both sides. So it's really um, actually always very connected. On the one hand, um, working with with uh, VCs, uh, with the investment side, um, getting them the insight, but then also on the other side, uh, working with the startups themselves, helping them with product solution, uh, problem solution fit, product market fit, go to market priorities, and, and making the right decisions quicker, I assume. Um, so that is almost like it, it can't divide between the two. Absolutely. So um, for either of you, how, how do analysts help startups get funding? So if I'm a startup and I want, uh, I'm looking for to raise a round, what role does an analyst play in helping me get that um, funding? I, I, I guess I could ask Richard. Yeah, so there's the, you know, the broad role and then the specific targeted role. And the broad role is by uh, perhaps offering uh, quotes for their pitch decks or data uh, for their pitch decks that they can use to demonstrate the size of a market, right? It's pretty much, um, it, you know, investors for the most part are not even going to look at you unless you can prove that there's a billion dollar market opportunity um, and that you can get a hundred million uh, in revenue out of that, you know, seven year period. So you need some numbers, right? And you can quote, one of the big firms that say, hey, cybersecurity is a $300 billion market. Um, you can quote one of the fake firms like Markets and Markets that says something is worth $3 billion in five years. Um, or you can, you know, you know, have a direct quote from one of the analysts at one of the firms. But the real way I find that I add value is I make introductions for the startups. If they're... Um, go to market and their products and their people uh, fit a investment preference, I guess, of the investors that I work with, I'm more than happy to just connect the two and see if it works. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. I've all also um, have the perhaps misconception, I don't know, the idea that if an uh, uh, an investor and, you know, all the big ones use, you know, use the analysts for this. If an investor is um, vetting a startup, they're, they're looking at either a space to invest in or a particular brand, they might go to analysts to inquire to see. And now obviously if they're in a magic quadrant and those things, they've got that visibility, it helps. But do, um, do analysts help with any of the, you know, uh, uh, do investors help? No, do analysts help investors make decisions in startups? I'm sorry. I wish that were the case. Um, in usually by the time I talk to an investor, they've already made their decision. Um, oh, interesting. They, they do. They do like validation. Um, but usually, that call is to make sure that the analyst is aware of the startup they're planning on investing in. And then the analyst, you know, it's on their radar. They can follow them. They can. Oh, they can interesting. So it happens the other way. It, right? Yeah. Yeah. Investors pretty much think they know everything already. I've heard I don't of that. know. I don't know if that's true for present company, but. Well, so I think. That, yeah. So two thoughts. One is I think that that statement that, that Richard just made is really the core. Uh, like takeaway of, of all of the work that you guys do, which is like, whether you are an investor, whether you are a company, uh, too many times people are waiting to go to analysts when they have a finished product, uh, right? Like a decision has been made as opposed to going to them earlier and having them help them inform the decision, right? And I Very think that's true. like the key thing to get across, which is like, you can't, don't wait. Don't wait just to get validation. And, you know, 50% of the time they may tell you you were wrong, but you're like too or set in your ways to, 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 mm -hmm. to listen, right? Um, so I think that's a really important point. And then I think the point related that, that Richard mentioned related to like how analysts can help startups, like especially like where we operate, which is in the seed stage, right? Like, so these are very early companies, right? And we are essentially investing in two things, the team, and the mm -hmm. market, right? Mm -hmm. Do we think that there is a market opportunity? And then do we think that the team uh, is capable of, uh, you know, the right team to, to support to achieve that market opportunity? 
Um, so having the for the startup to have more data, to have more insight into the actual market opportunity, um, as opposed to the fake quotes or these different things, right? And the other thing from an investment standpoint that we're seeing uh, that has evolved over the last, say, three years, right? Like the growth at all cost, it's got to be a it's got to be a, a a five billion dollar market, and this company has to become a unicorn. Like that's out of vogue now. People are saying like, actually, you know what? I would like a good, healthy company. Crazy, um, right? And in doing that, you're seeing a lot of like vertical SaaS become popular, and like like it, it isn't like necessarily has to be horizontal. It doesn't have to have have to be a hundred billion dollar market. Uh, but if that's the case, then you better know the market. You better know yeah. what opportunity exists and so i think actually for those companies the role of analysts and actually truly like building a business around insight and knowledge and not just assumptions and guesses is going to be even more important so i think this conversation is you know is, is crucial at this moment i want to add one one thing there um to uh the conversation between richard and, and alan uh, because what 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 we find is that when startups start to uh, begin to speak with uh, with analysts, just when their pro product is finally you know feels ready, um, that is so late uh, because it will take time for a startup to build the um, the credibility and the confidence with an analyst that their model is viable, that they're you know that they will fly and and this thing actually works it, it doesn't come with a single briefing that doesn't happen with a snap of a finger so you will need time to build up that confidence over time and while you're doing that you can take all that um feedback and insight from the analyst back into your business and become that better company that adam has just described that well oiled machine functioning scalable it, you know, understanding the market, understanding your competition, understanding your own best angle into this market and becoming a really viable player. So the main thing that we see is you have to start really, really early and go about it strategically. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, that uh, I remember, Robin, our conversation with Martin Kuppinger from Kupinger Cole, and he mentioned that they get uh, occasionally drawn into, well, not occasionally, quite often, pulled into due diligence um, conversations. So that's obviously not at the identification stage, so that is a bit later, but it's a very important aspect as well. And usually for M&A, not for investment, right? Well, I think both, right? Yeah, you know, the private equity does due diligence, right? They they have a little bit more responsibility to report to their limited okay. partners or sor sources of capital, but VCs, not as much, right? They create a PowerPoint, as... and the associates create it, but they don't do a lot of research. That's what I've heard, especially in the, the early stage companies. There's not a lot of due diligence there, but I have heard, um, Chris, you had told me once one of your clients, um, with customers talks about their all the work they've done with with um with gartner as a matter of fact and how much they've learned and that that um impress you know it's very impressive to customers it shows a level of maturity and substance in the in the organization i wonder does the same thing happen with investors if a startup is you know making a pitch and shows and indicates that they've been working with analysts does that give a certain confidence to the investor that that company has a certain amount of maturity and intelligence. Is that, is, does that resonate, um, Adam? And it's okay if it doesn't. Yeah, no, I, I think it would. I would say that that's probably, given at least the space uh, that we operate in, uh, rare uh, at that early stage, right? And I think like, you know, Chris made, uh, a really valid point and like from my experience as uh, an operator uh, at a startup right like startups uh, uh, live in a paradox of like a lot of these things to build a successful company takes time uh, right and investment uh, not just like capital investment but like the investment of time 
like what we're saying, like going to the analysts sooner than later, uh, while they are operating with a finite runway of time, right? And I think the, and this would be interesting to hear Richard's uh, perspective on this is like, I think that most startups think of analysts as a distribution mechanism, right? Like get me in the, the, the wave or the um, magic quadrant or whatever, right? As opposed to an intake uh, vehicle. Uh, and as a result, they like are, have heard, heard so many horror stories of like, oh, we got in the wrong box and it totally screwed our company up. Uh, we don't want to talk to them until it's right. Um, and that's where like, you know, we were saying you were just kind of alluded to that, like, you know, some VCs don't do due diligence. Like, I do think a lot of people do due diligence. They just have a lot of different channels of that, whether that be their, they have LPs who have expertise in different areas, et cetera. Right. And it's like, it's it's where the analyst relations community can continue to figure out how they give offerings or 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 make themselves like um, known and available and like a, a a tool that the investors are 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 leveraging as well too right and I think that's part of the thing is the misconception that they're super expensive and they're not reachable and they're uh, you know what I mean these months six month long projects and all these different things in a world that's operating in seconds. Uh, and so it's like, how do we eliminate that so that everybody in this tr this kind of triangle that we're talking about gets the value of each other that that is yeah. there for the taking? I agree with the the statement you made, Adam, that most startups view the analyst firms as a channel, right, to to accelerate sales after they've got their pitch down, et cetera, and, and also agree that they should be talking way much earlier, right, at the inception stage if they have. You know, especially if they have previous experience doing a startup, worked with analysts in the past, then they should immediately let the analysts that they know, um, uh, let them know that they are working on something. And it's going to be really cool, whatever. They don't have to tell them exactly what it is or it could be in a certain space. Um, and then continue that working. So to Chris's point, when you are pitching investors, you, can, you name drop. You know, you demonstrate that you understand how enterprise sales works and that you've already engaged the analysts in such a way that, you know, they're they're in for the ride. So that and that just builds your credibility as somebody who understands what that journey that Adam was mentioning is all about. Yeah, definitely. And I think Adam uh, said uh, usually earlier uh, when he said, well, we're really investing in the market and the team. now." If the team demonstrate well, first of all, the teams in startups, I, I think there's there's two different types. There's you know your, your startup where you have your twenty somethings quickly programming um, a new tool, um, a great thing, without much business experience on their back because they're just starting, they're enthusiastic about their new thing, and they likely don't know much about uh, the part of the playing field that's industry analyst relations. So for them, early stage might be very little knowledge about analyst relations and, and a totally different relationship to that. Then there are startups of people in their 40s, in their 50s or later, um, who've worked at technology companies for a million years, at some point decide, well, let's do our own thing here. We see there is a gap in the market that we can fill. And they may have 10, 20, 25 years of previous experience about this part of the playing field they might be very educated about what it means to engage with industry and, and so on and so forth they still when they set up their company they will you know start small in pre-seed seed stage and so on well. but you can have very experienced people in very early stage startups of course um and 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 that is i think plays very much to what Adam described, um, to investing in the market where you get the, the knowledge from the analyst side and you invest in the people and they can be early stage, but they can still be experienced with that. Now, if a startup um, engages early with, with analysts, you may not end up immediately on an MQ or a wave. That's, you know, illusionary. But there is quite a, um, a chance that you end up as a, um, a viable example vendor in something like a market report or an emerging tech radar or you know these kinds of things and that of course puts you 
on the map, it demonstrates that you have this savviness, that you know this matters, and you know you've, you've brought your, your company to the attention of the right voices in the market. You've even arrived as an example vendor in such a report. And that tells the investor those two key questions that, that Adam mentioned, experience and quality of team and relevance in that market. And that is quite amazing because that can happen extremely early if you do it right. You know, um, I just wanted to ask something that just ju just jogged my memory because I think a lot of startups are concerned about talking to analysts early because they're concerned about, um, you know, speaking about offerings that's not fully defined yet, you know, they might get negative analyst commentary or they may be revealing some secrets. You know, how, I guess the question is for Richard, you know, how, how, what would you say to startups that might be concerned about using this path that can help them eventually with their funding? Say most analysts are so busy that as soon as they hang up the Zoom call or the phone, they're going to forget everything you told them. So, <laughs> you know, don't don't sweat it. If you leave them remembering the name of your company and what it does, you won, right? That's just tremendously valuable, right? You'll be top of mind on their next call where it's with an end user customer who happens to need what you're offering. They'll drop your name. It's, it's just how their brains work. Um, and maybe I'm generalizing from me, but <laughs> that's how my brain works. Interesting. And do you think there's any, um, I, I know NDA is a, is a, and you know, most analysts will respect NDA. Um, and I think I'm always saying to startups that are maybe concerned, um, that analysts will not reveal, you know, not going to go, it's not a journalist, not going to go talk about what you're doing. Is that fair to say? For the most yeah, it's for the most part that's fair to say. Um, they may, you know, they may incorporate something you taught them, right? You might be telling them how la large language models can do X, Y, Z, and then they may think it's their own idea, um, which is good. You know, if, if you can leverage that later on, it's great. Um, and they may blurt it to somebody else. So, um, unlike investors, who will talk to you as if they're going to invest in you, but they already have an investment. They, they're conflicted if they invested in you, but they may share everything with their current investment portfolio company or pick, you know, maybe looking at everybody in the space, they'll pick one, but they'll have the knowledge that they gain from everybody else, which will help them in a competitive situation. So I just have a quick question for, for uh, Chris and Robin. So we're talking about, hey, this is really valuable for startups. Um, so I'm a startup. Uh, I don't have a subscription to any analyst firm or anything like that. Like, how do I actually get Richard on the phone? Yeah, I I, I can talk to that if you want, Chris, or you can, sure. you can take it. Um, I'm, I'm into Gorilla AR, meaning, you know, startups don't have a lot of money. You know, what can we get? without buying a subscription right away, you know, because that I think, you know, there's a conception if I buy a subscription, I get coverage or, you know, something good happens and, and it doesn't work that way. Right. So um, and if it if it does go the other way. Um, but so my experience is that analysts and you can uh, you can weigh in on this, Richard, are very interested in um, uh, innovation and interested in what's happening. They know innovation happens at the startup level. So with that interest, you can almost always, if you've got a good story and something innovative and disruptive, you can get an analyst time without you know, spending for a subscription. You can get briefings with all the relevant analysts in your space. And we build as much as we can of a relationship just briefing until it gets to the point that you want a deeper relationship with them. So it doesn't have to cost a lot, uh, anything in the beginning to start briefing analysts. Totally agree with that. Um, analysts just love to be in the know and they want to be the first in the know, right? And they're going to have, uh, they're going to, if they are the first in the know, they are going to write about it. Even if it's only their blog or their official research, they're going to start talking about it because 
you included them in the small circle of people. Yeah, and then that eventually gets back to the investors, and that's how the cycle works. Yep. yep. I wanted to throw a little bit of salt into that, um, in that um, I, I've seen, you know, that there's this avalanche of startups coming down the mountain like all the time. So it becomes quite difficult for um, for analysts to sift through and decide: is this startup really worth? you know, spending my time um, because there's only so many hours in a day because there's hundreds and thousands all the time coming up new. So um, a big challenge for startups is, first of all, to identify analysts to whose research agenda they are actually relevant. You know, it's, there's, there's 10,000 industry analysts in the world with, you know, in probably just as many, you know, segmentations of, of markets and um, a big a big hurdle for startups to to get through and get to to Adam's question get onto the calendar of the right industry analysts is to find the right person find the person to whom you will be relevant and the second hurdle then is in your you know um, reaching out to them explain yourself in a way that makes sense to them. And that does not come across as, as you know marketing or selling something, but yes. um, addressing their research, um, demonstrating the potential fit that you believe uh, should be there, and just through the way of how you write this thing, demonstrate that you're not that this is not a sales pitch. This is not you know you're not trying to sell anything, but you're trying to establish. Um, a mutual beneficial relationship where you just want to exchange your thinking and um, and these kinds of things. And that's, for many startups, that is really difficult because they're all in, in you know, in self-promotion mode and um, it, it's just very, very hard for them. Not just startups. Not just startups. <laughs> yeah, that's hard for, right. hard for all vendors. Adam, did that how do you feel about the, the sort of natural conflict uh, that is between an analyst who is looking at the macro and, and thinks about things right like in buckets uh, and he has to think you might have to think about those buckets from like a long period of time and an anal and, and then a startup whose intent is to disrupt that bucket right how many times every time I talk to a startup they're like oh we're a new category um right and like oh that analyst like they think about this in this antiquated uh, way and like that like is that is that that richard from your standpoint is that conflict healthy um or do you find it like also somewhat like uh naive too yeah i lean towards the naive because i've heard that so many times right every single vendor even though they obviously fit in a bucket will say, no, we're a totally different category. We don't want to be compared to those guys. And that's just, uh, that's the naive part. You are going to be compared to those guys. At the very least, no matter how different you are, you're going after budgetary dollars. And those dollars are already assigned to a category. And if you don't belong in that, you could be in a lot of trouble. My favorite example is actually the fault of Gartner. So there was a well-defined category of threat intelligence vendors with about 127 vendors in it. And some idiot at Gartner said, you know, threat intelligence isn't sexy, doesn't have three-letter acronym. Um, so we're going to call it digital risk protection. And all of the Gartner clients and those that wanted to be in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which doesn't exist for threat intelligence, um, immediately jumped on that and changed their website to say that they're digital risk protection companies. Now their SEO is shot, right? If somebody's searching for threat intelligence, they're not going to find these companies because they're digital risk protection, which means nothing. Nobody's got a budget line item for protecting digital risks. You, you wouldn't even want to do that. So, yeah. I, that reminds me of this famous um, fun quote to CNN. Hey, Wolf, everything is not breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and I think the... Um, there is the interplay of category creation and differentiation, positioning and differentiation. That's a very delicate triangle that you need to navigate because 
a category of one doesn't help any doesn't help yourself to only competition makes the market so you want to be recognizable in the language and in the terms and in the as as richard said in the budget you know spaces um to get on the list at all. and once you've once you've achieved that then you can still you know say well in our ideal customer profile is so and so and we differentiate in this way to provide a differentiated a new type of value that you, you know offers a new principle to this market that maybe even moves the market you don't always have to create a new thing you can also be disruptive to the market in moving the criteria and thereby having some players fall out of the magic quadrant if you will you know if your if your idea is powerful enough so the whole you know triangle between categories and positioning and and differentiation that's a very delicate game and it's one of the main things that robin and i um have to support someone right. getting this right to get in and then make an impact and, and i have so a question for, for adam to that like do investors think about categories do those categories influence in you know your decisions about the startups that come to you you know um do they influence your understanding of the technology spaces i'm just wondering what the categorization how that relates to investors if it does yeah i mean i think that like um uh when when i, I get i i am uh, uh hesitant when somebody wants to be a brand new category right like i think uh, what richard said about like what's the budget uh who and who are you stealing budget from uh is like uh, because what i want is like an actual business uh that uh, that that makes money and I think that's where, like, that's an underutilized uh, benefit of analysts for both investors and startups, which is like they talk to a bunch of companies and they know the questions that those companies are having, right? Like, as I mentioned, we talked, we do market and team. Well, these teams are all good and they can make their uh, pitch sound amazing. Uh, but you know what? Like, you know what difference between like a, a company that fails and a company that succeeds is like it's a must have versus a nice to have right and everything's nice to have and everything can sound great and can sound revolutionary it's like when there's actually dollars that need to be spent what are they spending it on and like that's where like like i think analysts know people are asking if, they, if they've heard somebody ask the same question six times then that's probably a need that people have and that is i would like to solve that need versus like some made up need because that would be a, a cooler category Also, keep in mind the interplay between how you talk to investors versus how you talk to analysts. When you talk to an investor, you do have to make large claims for the size of the market you're addressing. Uh, you would probably pick a category. You would say, hey, we're the, the new version. We're, we're applying AI to security information and event management, right? Logs. Um, and, so that, and that's a multi billion dollar industry. So go for it. When you talk to the analysts, you wouldn't say, you know, we're the category winner or we have a new category. You would say, we're the only ones who do this for public uh, education in Florida, right? We And we're going to own that space, right? It's crossing the chasm all over again. You're going to own it. And then in the meantime, you're going to move into other areas and, and keep winning. Totally. Also, I... I mean, we touched on this slightly before when we spoke about NDAs and so on and sharing sensitive information. I want to put a slightly different angle to that, not in terms of, um, uh, you know, disclosing information. I think we've covered that. But uh, when you're a startup and you're developing something new and it's not fully there yet, it's not completely polished. Um, they're often afraid of sharing that with an analyst because they fear they might get, you know, smashed for it not being ready or not being perfect yet. Um, Adam, Richard, how, how do you see that? How, how do you respond to those concerns? Uh, take the analyst along for the ride, you know, and, and in particular, keep track of what you've said to them, you know, so you first explain how you're going to do something. Um, next time you talk to them, make sure somebody like you or Robin is there to remind you of what you told them last time. Um, and then build on it. Say, you know what, we, after talking to you and thanks to your great advice, um, we looked at it again and now we're moving in this direction. So you keep the continuity of the story all the way up to your IPO. 
Yeah, Indiana? my experience is, is, you know, analysts recognize that startups are pivoting and changing and evolving, and those that are eager to involve the analysts in that journey um, are really well perceived by the analysts. I'd say, Chris, you also mentioned earlier, you were talking about how, like, there's different types of startups, right? And there's like the, the young, young, younger startups. Uh, there are uh, startups that are led by um, more, more seasoned uh, professionals. Like we're also seeing, there's like, you know, there's there's startups that are led uh, by deeply technical founders, all right? Which was particularly like when I think of you know, Dine, the company I was at, those were you know WPI, um, you know, deeply technical like. Uh, engineering founders, right, with not a ton of go-to-market experience. But we're also seeing a little bit of like the democratization of tech and that it's like you don't necessarily need uh, this uh, revolutionary secret sauce technology that's never been invented before to build a successful company. And we're seeing, uh, you know, GTM leaders um, starting companies as well too, right? And to, to that dichotomy that the technical uh, engineer might uh, hold their baby closer to their chest until it's perfect before they go and talk to it. Whereas a GTM person who's like selling something that doesn't even exist yet uh, may also be more likely to bring in the analyst. So I think it'd be, it would be interesting to kind of see how that plays out over the next couple of years because there's going to be different types of founders and it'll be interesting to see how they engage with the analyst community differently and then the results of that uh, kind of interaction. Interesting. Interesting angle. Thank you. My observation is that analysts are not journalists. They are not they're they're not in the business of disclosing stuff as early as they can to to anyone in the world. They're in the in the business of understanding things. Understanding things and letting them evolve, supporting that evolution and um, at the right, you know, once because they want to see those things mature and become, you know, ready and and uh, successful in the market because then it gets more impactful and interesting to talk about write about and and to see how it how it continues so the entire mindset and the entire business model is not hurt something let's put it out there for everyone that's not the thing it's learn something compute and and grow my understanding so um it's just a matter of business model i i feel richard we agree um, um, yeah. yeah. Well, well, when you when you when you I'm uh, echoing. How do I stop that? I stop it? I think it stopped. Okay. When when you talk about analysts not being journalists, they do though um, pull on threads and track things down over a long, long time. So if you are a vendor and you are going to market with a completely made up fake story. I won't, you know, make you have to edit this uh, video um, by mentioning them, but they're just a totally wrong story, right? And they fooled the Wall Street, they fooled everybody into thinking that they do X. The analysts, you know, they're not ready to go to press, right? They don't have that outlet, um, but they can talk to their clients and say, you know, I'd stay away from those guys, they're just making things up. Um, but they will track it over years to try and catch the the vendor in obvious misstatements, which they will eventually call out. And yeah, yeah. So hey, I just want to jump in. Um, sorry, Richard, I didn't mean to step on you, but I want to jump in on a question on the the chat. Um, how do investors view niche or visionary players in the MQ? So, Adam, I know you work with very early early stage, um, but do you have any? perspective on this that if you're looking at if you were looking at a, a potential um uh investment and they were a niche or a visionary not a leader is that a negative yeah i i think that the the key takeaway here is for for companies and for people to realize is that there's different types of investors right and there's different types of investors as far as like there are some investment firms that are really just financial management uh, right, like they're just looking at spreadsheets and trying to manipulate it so that uh, they get the positive outcome. Right? Then there are investment firms that are run by operators and have deep technical experience and understand what it takes to build a company and 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 those different things. Then there are investment firms that 
are putting a ton of money and they want a hundred X return to pay back the fund. And then there's ones that are, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, responsibly investing and they can get a, a $25 million acquisition, uh, you know, everybody wins, right? And so I think that like, as a startup, you have to make sure that you know who you are, like not all money's created equal, not all money is right, uh, and, and kind of do your due diligence, right? Like it's a two-way street, like uh, the investment firm needs to do due diligence of the, the company, the company needs to do due diligence of the investment firm. So I think there are investment firms that would look down upon a niche uh, player because that's not the game they're playing, Whereas there's other ones that would be like, great, I want you to be the best niche player uh, that's ever been created because that's that's what we invested in and that's what we wanted, right? I think it's the misalignment between all of the people on the cap table of a company that causes problems, right? And if you can get all of those people aligned, investors, founders, uh, you know, uh, the the team members, advisors, um, and you all are rowing in the same direction, then you know where you end up is going to be where you you know want it to end up. I think that really shows it's so important to have analysts to be investors. Investors who understand how industry analyst relations works and how those products like the MQ or a wave or so work. Because if you think of it, if a startup ends up on one of those ranking vendor reports, they are part of maybe the top 15 or so companies that have been evaluated for this segment. There's hundreds behind those who didn't make the cut, who didn't make it onto that report. So they are, no matter where they are positioned on this report, they are amongst the 15 most relevant, most noteworthy players. Doesn't mean they have the best product, doesn't mean they have the, you know, the largest uh, business or whatever, but they are noteworthy uh, for their completeness of vision, ability to execute, whatever your axes are. If you think of the entire market, you have to prolong the ax axis and the y axis to the negative and to the um to the left if you will and then you become the complete picture of the market and the magic quadrant with its four quadrants it's actually the upper right hand corner of the entirety of the market so as soon as you end up on one of these things you you have a huge <laughs> being very very visible um as opposed to all the other guys and the question for the startup is if you if you enter a market you typically enter in this entirety of the market in the bottom left hand corner nobody knows about you nobody knows your vision you haven't had a chance to prove your ability to execute so how do you work your way north um and to the right richard your your title up and to the right <laughs> um how do you work your way towards that upper right hand corner? And that's something that Robin and I typically don't help with. But um, so you have to understand the entirety of the market and the journey and the value that's in the journey itself already. Totally. Yeah, I think we should probably, you know, close up, Chris. We've, you know, we've uh, overstayed our welcome with these guys. Um, they've given us a generous amount of time. And did you have any last questions, Chris? Because we can just uh, wrap. Million. <laughs> million, right? But is there anything you want to throw in there before we wrap up? I wanted to ask um, um, Richard, maybe, um, that, um, I mean, we know that the several firms like the Gartners, the Foresters, the IDCs of this world, we know from your firm, IT Harvest, we've already mentioned Kupinger Coal. Um, as a firm that works regularly with with uh, both startups and um, and investors, are there other names in the industry that we should um, you know at, at least mention and just complete the picture? And is it more the the generalists or is it more the specialist firms that you see um, engaging? Uh, I think it's super important to identify any specialist firms because they'll be the only ones that cover your space. I, I've been looking at hardware security modules lately, right? And Gartner, Forrester, et cetera, I don't think they have waves or magic quadrants for that. But I do see market reports coming from specialist firms that are more interested in hardware, for instance. Um, you should, if you're naming 451, which Standard & Poor's and Forrester and Gartner and IDC, you should also name Ambia. Um, which is owned by uh, Informa, you know, big, huge media company. 
Um, and they've, they're generalists as well, but they've got, in my space, they've got a really big security practice. Cool. Thank you. Thank okay. You. I, would, I would just I'd just conclude by saying, like, I, I, I open by saying that I just went to Philadelphia, right? And we looked at the Liberty Bell. And the Liberty Bell is a tangible symbol of freedom and liberty, right? I, I think of analysts, think of analysts as like a symbol, right? We live in a hyper busy, uh, nobody's got time to think world where everything is reactive, right? And guess what? Like to be successful, you have to take time and find time to be proactive and to think and to strategize and to get ahead, right? And I think like, you know, thinking of analysts in that way as an opportunity to get the competitive advantage, just the, the simple act of talking to one shows me that you have slowed down enough to know that you live and operate outside of the four walls of your office in a broader ecosystem and community. And I think like if, if people left knowing that and thinking that, like that will be the competitive advantage of the future because most people are not doing that. That's great to say. And I, I think bet. you said something about investors um, when Richard was saying that there's not a lot of due diligence and you said investors should be, I think I, I think that's what you said, um, earlier going to analysts, getting more research, getting understanding before they make, you know, before they're just presenting it for a, a check mark, you know, that there's a value there that maybe investors aren't taking advantage of. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think due diligence is always quite a big word. And I think yeah. Richard, very right to point out that that's maybe um, for for other purposes like MA and so on. But if you think um, of you know small due diligence in that understanding qualifications maybe call it that way or uh, understanding. So how how do they play? How do they compete? How are they positioned? How relevant is their uh, their spiel in the in the market? Um, that is uh, something that constantly happens everywhere. All right. So if we want to close, I think what we can say is I think we learned that it is critical for startups to talk to analysts as and it has a lot of value. And one of the values it can do can have is um, impacting your in the, the, the funding that you get. I think um, I think uh, as we were just saying that there's greater opportunity for investment investors to use analysts to be smarter and be more competitive themselves and i just want to thank richard and adam for really a great discussion thank you so much for putting this together yeah thanks for having us oh yeah okay take care everybody do one plug, Robin. We have to do a quick plug because um, all that uh, insight that we're generating here through those discussions, through interviews, um, we're taking that to a next level again. Like two years ago, we ran the state of startups with industry analysts research, the initial research on it, and we're just ready to launch the second iteration of this research with a couple of questions not changing so we can track how things evolve over time. But with the majority of questions now addressing new fields of interest, especially around value creation, especially around uh, the specific um, tools, methodologies and, and um, offerings at uh, analyst firms and how analyst firms themselves are rated by startups, how effective they find them and so on and so forth. Also, more focus on the uh, VC side how they are working, what they find valuable, and so on. So make sure um, to stay tuned with Robin's and my LinkedIn feeds or follow our websites or so. Um, this thing will soon launch, and it'll be, um, hopefully, of at least as much value as last time. So. I think it'll be more, way more. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.